All right, gang. Um, I suppose we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're a minute over. Um, cool. So real quick, we're at Service Mesh Con. I'm sure you guys know that. Um, uh, uh, congratulations on surviving uh, the apocalypse as well. Um, anyways, um, real quick, this is a talk about Knative eventing, um, and more specifically what I'd like to refer to as a cloud native event bus. Um, think old school ESBs, but um, it's 2021 and we're gonna present uh, something a little bit different than a monolithic ESB. Um, we're going to inject Istio into this to attempt to get, give ourselves some notion of governance. Um, which Knative eventing may kind of lack. Um, about me, I'm a senior architect of Red Hat. I work in an emerging technologies practice um, in services. You can check me out at entropic.me uh, slash about, or you can go to mikecosloy.com, uh, so on and so forth. Um, all right, uh, let's uh, get started. So we've got two sessions as a workshop. Um, we're going to uh, initially introduce the workshop. We're going to talk about the rise of cloud native architecture and uh, why that's important. We're going to get into what governance is. Like, you know, it's uh, typically what I would call a bad word, but um, we'll see why it's important in this particular context. Um, we're going to talk about what K, uh, how Knative provides governance, why that's important in and of itself, and then um, why we would use something like Istio. Um, we're going to do a Knative deep dive. Um, we need to uh, kind of go figure out how Knative works with Istio. Um, Knative eventing uh, doesn't work right out of the box with Istio, so um, uh, we'll definitely want to do a little bit of a deep dive because we've got some things to do, which you guys will see in the repo I'll point you towards. Speaking of which, um, if you guys go to github.com, uh, my Coslo, Knative eventing examples, this is where everything's going to happen. I'm going to say that in, again in a second in case you didn't get it. Um, we're going to talk about governing Knative. We're going to do a demo. Um, where we're actually going to walk through some of this. We're going to discuss what happened. We're going to talk about some of the things, um, some of the governance items. Uh, and then in session two, we'll come back. We'll ask the existential question, how did it go? Um, uh, and then, um, of course, uh, there's probably some more things we could do with Istio that we're not demonstrating here. Um, so we'll talk about some of those things as well. So there's a little bait on the hook for you guys to come back to session two. All right, so the workshop intro. Um, again, as promised, there is that GitHub URL again. Um, please go there. Um, follow the instructions. It's going to take a while. In fact, it's going to take um, quite a long while. Um, it's going to take so long that we're going to get into theory and talk about why we're doing this to begin with um, for a while, and then uh, we'll check back in. Um, what we're using, we're using a Kubernetes system. Um, in my case, uh, I'm using OpenShift 4.8. You don't need to use OpenShift. In fact, um, you could really use any Kubernetes system um, as long as we're talking about um, a version past 119 or something like that. Um, and Istio 2x distro. In my case, I'm using Maestra. It's the uh, Red Hat um, operator. However, generally speaking, what you'll find is the primitives we're using are Istio primitives. There's nothing, mostly nothing specific um, that's going to happen that is Maestra specific. Um, so you can probably get away with just about any Istio distro as long as it's a 2x um, distro. We're going to um, uh, use Knative. In my case, again, I'm using uh, OpenShift Serverless. However, um, you don't need to use OpenShift Serverless. We're only using Knative Serving and Knative Eventing um, uh, primitives. Um, really, you could use most recent distros of Knative. So, if you guys don't have um, a, if you don't have a OpenShift available with all the OpenShift uh, fun, you can really just use, like I said, any Kubernetes distro, most Istio operators. Um, most Knative operators, so on and so forth, right? Um, and then I'm going to use something to demonstrate Knative services and how we kind of get on the cloud native event bus. Um, I'm going to use something called um, Camel K. Totally immaterial to what we're doing here. Um, as we'll note, um, what we're really after are these Knative serving primitives, such as a subscription. We're into. Uh, we're going to be looking at like channels, these sorts of things. So you don't need Camel K. I just happen to be uh, a little too fond of it, and um, it was laying around, so um, uh, we're using it here. 
So real quick, um, let's talk about the rise of cloud native architecture let's, uh, and why it's important. More specifically, let's take a little trip through history. And we'll kind of find how we got here. So um, initially, we had, main, uh, we had mainframe computing um, kind of give way to client-server approaches. So that was um, pretty cool, if you guys will remember, vividly the late 90s, uh, mid-90s. Um, so this was really cool because it democratized compute. You didn't need to go buy a million-dollar mainframe. You could go buy something um, uh, much smaller. One small problem, these things tended to be, at least our initial client-server implementations, tended to be a little heavyweight. Um, we started moving to things that, uh, and, you know, uh, what we're talking about are things like, uh, um, you know, fat clients, stuff like this. It was really quite difficult to go out and distribute software like this. Um, and so what we started doing is moving to uh, more distributed uh, software techniques. Um, this became, as mentioned, this became unwieldy, right? Um, and uh, some of the um, distributed uh, techniques we moved to, like RPC, Corba, so on and so forth, they were a little ugly. I think um, many of us have stubbed our knees um, and toes and got quite bloody because of Corba. Um, uh, really, really painful stuff um, if you were doing uh, RMI in the late 90s and early aught years. So we started publishing a variety of tool sets to kind of accommodate this, right? Um, we started thinking about things like asynchronous messaging, which um, fit quite nicely with um, some of the mainframe concepts we'd had in the past. We, um, uh, <coughs> we started um, uh, coming up with these things that were patterns that we noticed emerging everywhere. So um, uh, right, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, very buzzy, we, uh, we started coming up with a service-oriented architecture. We started uh, um, uh, coming up with things like enterprise integration patterns, where we would say, hey, we notice uh, some of these behaviors that happen quite a bit. Um, and uh, we, we actually want to encode this in uh, a practice and advocate usage of the pattern. So that was really cool, right? We got there, but, um, uh, oh yeah, and before we uh, talk about that, so initially, we kind of have these point-to-point -point remote invocations. We have thing A calling thing B, um, and uh, that moved, uh, uh, we may have uh, even had web services or various other RPC things, one thing called the next. Um, we moved away from that, and as mentioned previously, we moved to something called uh, an enterprise service bus. This was hot, hot, hot in the mid uh, aught years. Um, and uh, we, we found, you know, as you guys probably well know, um, over the next decade or so, those types of monolithic implementations where everything is coupled to a central bus are great and all until we need to change. So we started looking at things like microservices and started, started advancing our paradigm a little bit more, right? Where we got independent, pipe, uh, independent uh, deployment pipelines. We could change a little quicker, a little faster, without necessarily um, causing ourselves a ton of heartache. But over the last few years, we all had this ginormous edict, whether it came on high from our uh, CEOs, or it um, was just something that we thought um, sounded like a good idea, um, we began to move to the cloud. Um, that caused our, us a whole new list of concerns. What in the cloud, of course, um, we can't have point-to-point -point communication per se. We have to expect our infrastructure to fail. There needs to be something to accommodate um, uh, ephemeral uh, compute, ephemeral storage, um, so on and so forth. We had multi uh, and hybrid cloud desires. Remember, we've still got all this stuff, right, from, all, uh, the, from the little stroll through history we just took. We've still got all this stuff stuck in a data center. We didn't want to go to the cloud and not be able to exploit those things. So we had to start coming up with ways where we would um, say, hey, I want to be hybrid cloud. We also probably had some edict from, uh, again, somebody on high saying, thou shalt be multi-cloud, right? They didn't want to get stuck in AWS. They, wanted, they had dreams of being able to go off to um, Azure and all of the rest of the cloud providers. We needed to distribute uh, we, um, our compute density and efficiency are front and center. Right When this edict was made, thou shalt go to the cloud, nobody thought we were going to be actually more expensive. 
right? We, as we decompose things into microservices, we started to notice a big explosion of compute. And all of a sudden, we were getting AWS bills that were quite high. I remember about 10 years ago having a discussion with our CFO, and he was like, hey, man, I could have bought a new data center for the run rate that we were doing in a quarter, right? Uh, painful stuff, and it became front and this uh, that becomes front and center in this move to the cloud. So we also want to distribute our architecture across availability zones. What we really mean by that is we don't want to be stuck in a single um, we don't want to be stuck in a single location. That was one of the problems that we always had in the past, right? Our DC goes down. We don't really have a great way to move to some sort of passive data center or redundant data center. Et voila, bang, there goes our SLAs. There goes most of our use cases. The business stops. So we started to take on container platforms as a means to um, abstract this move to the cloud so that we could um, deploy things to the cloud that weren't necessarily specific to a particular cloud provider, right? If I am only using AWS managed services, perhaps I might uh, like to call myself cloud native, but I'm not really cloud native, I'm AWS native, right? If I go take these things off to another cloud and I go do the multi-cloud thing that I'm being asked or even hybrid cloud thing that I'm being asked to do, I've got a, I don't quite have a lift and shift. I have something uh, far bigger than that, right? It's quite likely that um, it'll be uh, quite difficult to replicate what I was doing there um, uh, in another, uh, <clears throat> in a, uh, another uh, cloud. All right, so what does that mean? So we went from point to point. We had, you know, um, this RMI stuff happening in the late 90s, early aught years. We took on some SOA concepts, right, web services. That kind of morphed into the SOA concepts, like an ESB. We decomposed that, um, pardon the pun, and we found ourselves with uh, microservices, right? And now that we've gone to um, the cloud, we uh, are attempting to take on these cloud-native architectures. And some of the things that we want to take on with cloud-native architectures um, are things like we want to be able to scale to zero. Remember that resource and compute efficiency thing, right, became front and center. If I go say, hey, I'm going to go take the monolith and I'm going to break it into 40 parts, right, it's very difficult to go say to my boss or, um, uh, or my checkbook, hey, you know, that's, I've added in tremendous amounts of overhead. My bills are quite high. Um, uh, it's not a great look. We want to optimize uh, resource usage, and we also want to uh, avoid random arbitrary workload um, uh, problems. So for instance, what we really mean by that is, um, if I'm dealing with ephemeral compute, if I know that my, I may lose machine instances, I know that I may, um, I may lose an entire uh, availability zone, i.e. Uh, what we used to call a data center, I need to be able to handle this. Um, and that is kind of some of the tenets of what makes us cloud native. So what does cloud native mean, right? If this is the architectural jump or leap we're making, we've actually spent quite a bit of time um, defining this. It's rather laborious. If you, have, if you need to go to sleep tonight, um, I would read uh, from this Earl. We get really, really, really into why we're suggesting there are these cloud-native characteristics. But some of the cloud-native characteristics that we need to take on to have a cloud-native architecture are things like we need to, be, uh, we need to have uh, elasticity. We need to be scalable on demand. We need to be resilient. Remember, we have to survive a loss of an uh, availability zone. We simply can't say, ah, oh, well, um, that's tough. Uh, um, my particular availability zone in US East is down. Sorry, uh, sorry, SLAs can't do anything about that. We need to be observable and manageable, right? It's easy enough to say, hey, I'm going to go decompose things. I'm going to go put them in the cloud. But if I lose visibility and I lose observability, the same sorts of observability that I had in my, my more traditional legacy um, data centers, well, that's not really a good place to be. We also be, need to be location agnostic. Remember, our computers are ephemeral. Things are moving around. We can't necessarily say, hey, I'm going to go send this HTTP request at 10 so on and so forth, um, that's not really um, a, a viable premise. We need to be able to um, invoke, uh, uh, invoke an HTTP request. It's uh, completely agnostic of the um, physical place that this thing lives. We want to be API-centric. One of the reasons we want to be API-centric is, one, um, uh, again, in the cloud-native uh, integration, GitHub, uh, Earl, this there, we, um, we, we're in a container platform, we're in something that is API-driven and, uh, 
API and event driven. For our things to come and go, they exist in this API driven, API centric world, right? So we need our things to do something fairly similar. And we also, um, because things are coming and going, and because this can be sometimes happening quite fast, we want well defined APIs and we need to be able to handle um, event driven premises such as um, asynchronous invocation, um, so on and so forth. Remember, Taking on a cloud native architecture doesn't just mean, hey, I plop this thing into AWS or GCP um, or uh, DigitalOcean. If we rely solely on their uh, APIs, remember, as we were just discussing, we've got a big headache waiting for us. Um, we want to abstract that some way. The way that we would recommend, generally speaking, abstracting it, again, uh, we get really into this um, in that URL. But the way we would want to abstract that is via a container platform or some notion of abstraction. Whether that is Mesos, Kubernetes, so on and so forth, it's really immaterial, right? It's the abstraction itself that's important. Um, I would argue that Kubernetes seems to have won the day in this regard. However, um, let's not get too uh, hung up on Kubernetes as much as we get uh, uh, recognized we need this abstraction. And Kubernetes and containers alone are enough. We, we need a couple of things, right? We need uh, things to care and feed for our deployments. I don't want to spend, uh, one of the things we, I used to spend quite a bit of my time doing once upon a time was um, uh, configuration. In fact, um, generally speaking, we'll find uh, developers who are shipping microservices right now that don't rely on um, some cloud native abstractions and cloud native architectures, spend quite a bit of time figuring out how do I configure my deployment and runtime to work in this world. All right. So <clears throat> what does that mean, right? As we're on this kind of uh, um, stroll through history and we come to the present where everything is moving to the cloud. So you know, the ne that next logical iteration isn't just uh, cloud native, or this cloud native term isn't meaningless, right? We actually are after something. And one of the things we would, uh, uh, we or I, the royal uh, we, uh, or the Royal Eye, um, would argue for is that serverless fits this uh, paradigm quite well. In fact, um, serverless, uh, dis, uh, serverless um, conceptually promises us things uh, like scaling to zero, uh, resource optimization. Um, and again, we want to uh, avoid arbitrary workload prediction. By that I mean, I don't, uh, again, I don't want to say, hey, feel like we need three pods. I want something that actually scales to uh, bursts, the scales uh, ideally um, algorithmically, right, um, based on some uh, common constructs. Cool. So there's a lot of obviously serverless implementations out there. Um, as you guys probably guessed from the title of the talk, we're going to talk about Knative. Um, the uh, Knative, uh, so Knative uh, uh, is two kind of dis uh, separate things, uh, one of which relies on the other. So the, the main thing that um, Knative is, is something called, pardon me, Knative Serving. And that provides us some components that enable rapid um, deployment of serverless containers. Auto scaling, including scaling pods down to zero. This is based on sampling, um, uh, either from a KPA or HPA perspective, and will actually sit there and say, hey, every so often, right, um, I'm going to determine based on the samplings that I have, whether or not we've passed some threshold and I need to scale up, down, so on and so forth, or potentially even scale to zero. Um, it has support for multiple networking layers, such as ambassador, contour, courier, that's what OpenShift serverless ships with, but we'll, we don't want to use that, as we'll explain later. Um, uh, glue it, and Istio for um, uh, integration into existing environments. We also have point-in-time snapshots of deployed code and configurations. You get re in fact, I could spend the rest of the day talking about Knative serving. We could get really, really into what that last thing means and why it's important. But if we look at the schematic on the, uh, my right-hand side, um, I think your right-hand side too, um, uh, we'll notice that as we take in revisions to our uh, things that are running, 
One of the things we'll do is we'll actually spin those revisions up, see if they're viable. The Knative uh, will actually inspect them, go see if they actually ran, do they respond to health checks, so on and so forth, and shelve it, um, bring down our prior revision, and then bring back up our uh, current revision so that we can engage in this sorts of change without, uh, and role change without really having to do too much. It's baked into the framework. So what is Knative eventing? And this is what this talk is actually about, right? Um, so Knative eventing is something that enables developers to use event-driven architecture with serverless um, applications. So as we take on our cloud-native architectures, what we, one of the things we notice is um, uh, we need to be event-driven, we, uh, uh, we need to be location agnostic, so on and so forth, right? Um, event-driven architecture, specifically this, uh, the sorts of pub-sub behavior that you see um, uh, on the right-hand side, um, are actually quite good at this. Um, uh, the event-driven architecture that Knative Eventing uh, um, uh, espouses, um, we have uh, event producers and consumers that can come and go. Um, they are, of course, uh, location agnostic. They will see that uh, um, coming up. Um, and we essentially have um, a sort of, we, our dichotomy, if you will, is neatly put um, as sor uh, source and sync, right? Something is a source. We'll talk about the things that can be a source in a second. Um, and something is a sync. Some of the things that can be a source, uh, our event sources are um, primarily event producers. An event producer, however, may be something like Kafka, right? Um, so what we'll do is we create a, an event source that actually interrogates uh, in Knative eventing, that it interrogates our source, and then emits HTTP. If we look here on the schematic on the right hand, what we'll see is source one and source two. We have uh, a logical abstraction we refer to as a channel. Um, and then we have a logical abstraction that we refer to as a subscription. The, our syncs subscribe to channels. The channels are a uh, logical representation of our event sources. Some of these event sources um, could be uh, any number of things. I think we get uh, into that in a second. But um, for the moment, we'll just say they could be things like uh, just something we just, uh, created in memory. A, uh, a broker that we created in memory. It could be something like a real actual Kafka broker or NATS or um, any number of different things. Knative eventing as well as Knative uh, serving uses standard HTTP uh, uh, posts um, and it, it, it kind of sends uh, as we go create um, this thing that we see on the right hand side, right? We're informing the Knative eventing and Knative ser uh, serving components um, over HTTP. Now you can kind of see where um, a service mesh might fit in. We've essentially created ourselves an HTTP based control plane to engage in this sort of cloud native architectural stuff that we want like scale to zero, so on and so forth, or um, uh, put more succinctly, uh, serverless. One of the things that I think is really, really cool, and I'm going to bang this drum really loud um, in a few slides, um, is the events that are emitted over um, uh, this event bus are <clears throat> um, uh, conformed to something called the cloud event specification. What the cloud event specification is is a, a, a type of message payload that we always have over our um, over our event bus implementation. That means that um, we have a canonical payload. Normally, generally speaking, I would say stay away from canonical payloads. Uh, bad sauce, change is really difficult. However, what we'll notice with the cloud event specification is it's really just something that holds any number of different other types. In fact, it has a, a, an event registry, so on and so forth. And I think it's a really critical part of knowing what's happening, what can happen, and what can flow across our hybrid and multi-cloud implementations. Cool. So <clears throat> there's a big word at the beginning of the title of this talk um, called governing, and it implies governance, right? So let's, uh, and generally speaking in software, this is a dirty word, right? We all hate the governance guys that come down and say, uh, thou, thou shalt not do everything you're doing um, because there's some uh, magical governance fairy um, that we've offended. 
So um, MIT took this on, um, and I think this, are actually a, this is actually a pretty good definition of what governance is. We want to centralize information about our digital initiatives. So instead of having N bespoke systems all over the place, right, I actually want to give myself some way to cobble these things all together in a centralized fashion. I want to move um, from centralized to decentralized governance <coughs> of digital initiatives, meaning I can't necessarily run everything in the same place. I have to allow people to be able to go out and do the things that they need to do. Um, these could be any uh, different run times, different languages, so on and so forth. However, I still want that centralized information piece, and I still want some means of exercising control in a centralized way while handing over power to my developers and uh, let them do their thing. I want to decentralize ideation, but centralize idea evaluation and prioritization. I want to make sure my KPIs are meaningful. I want to make sure um, I, uh, my, uh, I want to avoid kind of siloed solutions or these bespoke things that we see all over everybody's enterprise right now, where we have 7,000 things providing auth oz. We have just about every sort of way to go about this. We need some notions of technical consistency across um, how we do these things, most noticeably. Uh, notably, um, uh, in a distributed computing context, we want centralized and consistent means of, and compatible means of wire protocols, of the schemas, uh, or rather the payloads that are happening over the wire. And we also want some way to do handshakes and stuff like that in a meaningful way. And of course, um, the idea here behind governance isn't necessarily, as uh, this white paper points out, isn't really to say, hey, I've stopped you from doing something, but it's rather to get all of the basic building blocks out of your way so that you can go leverage the things that you need to do to deliver to the business use case, or if you're just having fun, the features you're after um, uh, while we uh, deliver software. So one of the first things you know, we might think to ourselves is, well, you know, uh, Kubernetes might be enough, right, in and of itself. Um, I have uh, service accounts, um, uh, those things uh, that run my uh, ultimate or pods or run times. Um, we, we certainly don't hand out anything as service accounts, uh, generally speaking, willy-nilly, right? We also have some notion of RBAC there. There are, um, uh, we have cluster admin, we have developer roles, so on and so forth. Um, we have OAuth proxies, right? So we go likely um, in our Kubernetes uh, distro, depending on which one you're using. We may go out to an external OAuth provider, right? We may construct our own OAuth provider um, inside uh, the cluster. This gives us a common way of authenticating our runtimes, uh, ensuring that they can actually do the things that they want to do in Kubernetes. We have some ingress governance, right? We've gone beyond the node port at this point. We're not just saying, hey, go find a port on one of your nodes and hook up to it. Um, we have meaningful uh, ways of ingress. Um, we have MTLS uh, capabilities, TLS capabilities, so on and so forth. We have centralized monitoring and logging capabilities in most distributions, right? Remember, some of the things we were just after um, that white paper suggested we should be after is kind of mostly taken care of there. And we have an event-driven API control plane, right? Um, all over HTTP. And generally speaking, we have some technical consistency here between our RBAC approaches, how we do things over the wire, who gets to do what, how they uh, authenticate and authorize with each other. Um, but this provides a pretty basic level of governance and rudimentary notions of auth oz from a runtime perspective, right? So for instance, a classic example of this is, well, yeah, my service account presents a jot to the next guy, and the next guy may have a, be hooked up to an a external OAuth provider, and I may have been pretty good and got my service accounts in there. So yay, I'm authorized, and we had something do that in a meaningful way. But the thing that I'm actually doing in my pod or my runtime is hooking up to Nats or Kafka, or I'm hooking up to a database, right? That level of authorization and authentication is not addressed by Kubernetes alone. We need something more than that. We have bespoke communications protocols, schemas, and standards. There's nothing per se saying the things that are traveling over the wire will necessarily do anything but adhere to the Kubernetes API if they want to do Kubernetes stuff. But as I go speak from one, to, as I go, let's say, from one system to the next, there's nothing saying that I will be 
carrying a certain particular payload. There's nothing saying that I will adhere to any particular standards other than maybe some uh, basic uh, um, TLS type stuff, so on and so forth. Um, I generally speaking have bespoke runtime visibility, right? I see this nonstop almost everywhere I go um, uh, and uh, talk to people. I, I'll notice that they've got some other means of monitoring just about every system in, uh, that they have, right? Um, their services, generally speaking, um, uh, may one, uh, one group may be using prim uh, Prometheus, one group may be using AppDynamics, so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, um, what we'll notice in many uh, Kubernetes clusters is that this uh, notion of uh, runtime visibility is all over the shop. Um, and then we also have bespoke carrying and feeding. We'll notice that some people are just doing a plain old Kubernetes deployment. Some people are using an operator, and maybe that has some level of maturity in how it cares and fees for things, right? But it lacks total consistency. There's no one way that we go about this. So we know that Kubernetes in and of itself isn't enough to go after those uh, governance characteristics that our white paper stated. Well, another question, you know, I probably didn't prime the pump enough for you guys to answer this question, but another question that we have, we probably have at this point is, well, is Knative enough? Well, Knative kind of is, right? Like, we probably have a good deal of governance just from Knative. We have service routing, we have revision visibility, right? We have load balancing, blue, green, A, B, out of the box. This is all happening in a centralized way, in a technically consistent way. Many of the features that we'd even get out of Istio are sitting there in Knative. We have auto scaling via common means in HPA and a KPA scaler. I can definitely allow people to um, instrument HPA or KPA in ways that they want. Right, but um, you know, uh, generally speaking, I've at least said, hey, here are two um, constructs that we'll allow into our organization. I have central ingress into services. Um, I have, uh, we'll get into this in a second, but I have an activator, an autoscaler. These things are actually gonna talk to my services and that is how uh, traffic is getting directed there at least some of the time, right? So, and I also have the cloud event specification. Uh, we'll get into more on that in a second. Like I promised you guys I was gonna bang that drum, but, um, we, don't, we just don't have enough to complete the governance picture here either. Something else is needed to guarantee MTLS between components. It may happen to be the case that your um, Knative operator distribution is using, uh, has some means of wiring up MTLS, um, but you've probably got something else for the next thing you're doing, and something else for the next thing you're doing, so on and so forth. We don't really have a consistent uh, means of doing this. We certainly don't have a centralized way of doing this. This just becomes uh, another uh, bolted on appendage, Frankenstein style appendage. We, um, the service invocation between our components does not uh, apply off Oz. So we're kind of left up to ourselves to um, uh, handle whether or not something can or should uh, uh, call us. So we need something else for visibility into the performance of our components, right? We could hook up something like Prometheus, um, so on and so forth, but um, uh, we just simply, in and of itself, don't have um, enough there. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, yeah. And Knative, in and of itself, does not provide a set of rules for who gets to do what, um, uh, per se, right? Um, Knative in and of itself will say, hey, um, uh, you get to hook up to the event bus, you um, uh, can send, uh, um, as a result, things can go over here. But there's nothing to say, um, hey, I laid down a particular channel implementation and I'm, I'm authorized to do that um, out of the box. So one thing we do have, and this is uh, the drum I keep uh, promising to bang, um, is a cloud event specification. And this is a core governance capability that we want to take on in our um, uh, cloud native architectures. Um, what a cloud, with a cloud event specification is, I think I described this a little bit previously, but we describe data, uh, event data in common formats to provide interoperability across services, platforms, and systems. We know what's going to come in our cloud event specification. Even though we may have Avro, we may have Protobuf, so on and so forth, we may just have JSON, or heck, in some cases, we may just have um, a, uh, um, an encoded uh, string. 
we, um, uh, we have something around that, a payload, uh, uh, an envelope, uh, not to use a SOAP term, but an envelope that describes the uh, payload that's coming, uh, that's being shipped in between these services. This is the canonical payload of Knative eventing. Everything is a uh, um, cloud event. Um, uh, we could have, as we'll notice previous, uh, um, we could, this could be um, AMQP, this could be Avro, JSON, Kafka, MQTT, NATS, WebSockets, Protobuf. The um, picture keeps um, uh, emerging. What this allows us to do, because of the event registry of Knative eventing, is say, hey, we have um, a particular payload type that are um, uh, uh, associated to particular channels. For instance, if I have a NATS channel, right, um, I'm going to have a uh, cloud event sp uh, uh, cloud event spec ty type of NATS, right? And what this allows us to do is to move away from these bespoke, incongruous means of communication over the wire, right, and to say, hey, at minimum, I have governance um, and I know what is, uh, what is going over the wire, and I can uh, say, hey, or I shouldn't be able to say, hey, why are you guys doing, uh, like, why are you guys doing this really strange thing over HTTP um, as uh, it's not possible because of um, our K-native uh, uh, eventing uh, constructs, specifically the event registry. So, why not just use Knative then, right? I, I, you know, I kind of mentioned maybe you know don't take care of everything, but um, the default ingress per vehicle is Courier. Courier is a plain old Envoy proxy, and it lacks a lot of advanced capabilities that Istio um, does not. For instance, uh, there is no concept of um, uh, destination rules, so on and so forth. Yeah, we could probably ship an Envoy filter there, but there's a, a whole lot of constructs and primitives from Istio that we just simply don't have. Um, we're not wiring up MTLS um, out of the box. We, remember, something else needs to handle this. Istio, um, all depending on how we go about things, will handle this out of the box for us. Um, Knative eventing also leaves um, some governance pieces wanting. While many of the uh, Knative eventing sources provide means of authentication and authorization, th that's bespoke by component. By that, what I mean is, hey, I sure I can go talk to my Kafka brokers if I lay down a Kafka channel and I configure myself with some sort of auth, right? And um, uh, all depending, I may, uh, uh, if I've wired up Kafka correctly to handle the thing that's calling it, right? I may have some notion of authorization there. But I have no consistent central means of going about, uh, centralized means of going about this. The next time I do this, it's going to be something different, so on and so forth. What we'll notice is we have an explosion of these bespoke activities over our enterprise uh, without using something like Istio. All oh, right. And I think I've covered, oh yeah, and you know, some of the things that we have in Istio, and um, uh, it's an advanced concept that we won't show in, uh, here, but we will uh, make a recommendation later. There's no advanced authorization such as OPA, right? We, can, we aren't able to leverage any of these things with Knative. We're kind of stuck with what we got. Um, or we can go say, hey, um, AM, or uh, let's say Streamsy or Kafka, hey, you go figure out the OPA thing based on the OAuth um, and JOT that was provided to you. Well, again, that's gonna be the same JOT every time because it's coming from the same Knative component. I can't really do much with that, right? I certainly can't um, uh, give myself the ACLs that I would like to give myself um, uh, in something like Kafka, right? I, uh, again, a, a topic I could go on and on and on about. So <clears throat> um, let's do a Knative deep dive, right? Because that's what we're here to do. We're here to talk about um, uh, Istio and Knative together. So um, I'm going to uh, do this. Um, so uh, if you guys will notice, maybe I'll come down here and point to some stuff. Hopefully uh, my screen doesn't go blank on us. So here is kind of our, the lay of our land, right? Um, we have a little legend over here. Um, uh, maybe somewhat useful, but here's uh, what's really going on here. We have an ingress gateway in our particular case. If we want to expose ourselves um, uh, to the outside world, um, we're probably creating a virtual service in Istio. 
The things that are really, really, really important um, in Knative, uh, and this is a look at Knative serving uh, pretty much exclusively, but it, um, uh, you'll see quickly why this applies to Knative eventing. We have an activator. So when a, an HTTP call comes into um, uh, my ingress gateway, for instance, here um, via Istio, one of the first things it's going to do is, is going to hit the uh, activator assuming I'm scaled to zero. That means it's going to start bringing instances up. The, um, <clears throat> our controller and dispatcher will actually continue talking to, um, uh, to our autoscaler as well. So the activator is going to bring stuff up. It may uh, say, hey, by the by, autoscaler, um, I'm at zero, I'm at one, so on and so forth. We'll notice that we also have, um, uh, uh, here we uh, represent uh, a um, <clears throat> uh, KPA. What that would mean is I've got some metrics like uh, concurrency or something like that that actually does this uh, scaling for me. We, um, we're, re we're constantly referencing this deployment while um, uh, our um, autoscaler is uh, running. And as you can notice here, we're gonna push metrics to the autoscaler and the autoscaler will actually bring these guys up and down all based on those things, right? Inevitably, what will uh, continue happening is these HTTP requests as um, the activator and uh, autoscaler are kind of doing their thing. Hey, do you need to come up? Hey, do you need more guys, right? Um, we're going to be sending uh, um, things into our actual deployment, and that's going to be actually uh, doing the stuff that we want to do. In our case, doing the stuff that we want to do may be something as simple as a hello world, hey, I'm a, I'm a REST service. Um, could be something a little bit more complex um, that we'll show later. So the Knative serving components, we have our activator. Um, again, that's what's responsible for um, receiving and buffering requests for inactive revisions. We've got, it reports to the autoscaler, as we mentioned. We have the autoscaler that is going to take in our metrics and adjust the number of pods required to handle the load of traffic, right? We could go up and down. The service controller is going to reconcile um, uh, the, object, the CR, our CRs that are coming in and is going to do something, if I say, hey, I've got a Knative, this is a Knative service. Um, here's your image, so on and so forth. The service controller is gonna be the thing that says, okay, cool, I, I know what to do with that. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and Knative serving, I'm gonna go ahead and create some revisions, I'm gonna test them out, I'm gonna mark them viable or not viable, so on and so forth. By that I mean, in Knative serving, if I roll change out to Knative serving and that change does not work, Knative serving isn't going to stop answering. It's just going to maintain the current revision, right? Which is um, uh, kind of gives us some uh, a notion of a canary release out of the box. Um, we also have our uh, we also have a, a, a dynamic admissions webhook. What this is going to do is it takes in that that initial CR, right, and says, "Hey, um, you know, I, I you gave me a, a Kubernetes service thing, and um, that's cool. Like, uh, you're able to. I'll admit you." But, um, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I should just uh, go back. There's two flavor, there's two parts to our webhook. We have uh, an admissions uh, configuration and we also have a validation configuration. The admissions configuration will say, hey, okay, cool, I got, I got the CR from the Cube API. Um, yeah, you know, you're allowed to do this, uh, your particular jot from your particular service account, that's cool. The validation um, uh, configuration will then say, hey, wait a second, yeah, you kind of screwed up your configuration of your um, Knative service. Um, I'm actually gonna reject you. you the CR will not be successful in the Cube API server, will not get a um, admissions response that um, <clears throat> is meaningful and uh, tells it, hey, I need to launch this pod. We're gonna start going a little faster because we're running out of time and I wanna to get to the demo before session, uh, at least part of the demo before session two. This will help though. Um, so Knative ser uh, Serving um, integrates with Istio out of the box. What we'll see here is right under our, um, uh, right under the uh, spec part of our YAML, we'll notice that we have Istio enabled, right? However, if we just remembered what we were looking at um, a couple of slides ago, there's a few things that have to happen after ingress, right? I have to go to the activator. I've got the autoscaler likely also involved, right? So we're going to have to, for those who participate um, uh, in, in a service mesh, we actually need to inject a proxy there as well. 
Um, I'm, uh, like I said, using Maestra. Um, generally speaking, this is a good approach. But we want to opt into um, uh, sidecar injection. We don't just want to label a namespace and have sidecars injected all over the place. There's a reason for that. There's a bunch of other things in Knative serving that don't actually need to um, uh, sidecar injected. We certainly wouldn't want to add that sort of overhead, so on and so forth, um, uh, to everything that's going on there. Um, unless we uh, need to. All right, so Knative eventing. Here is, so that was Knative serving. As you guys see, um, it's good stuff, but we need to do a little bit more with our operator and our CRs to be able to get ourselves to the point where we're using Istio. We, um, Knative eventing is um, what we're actually after. Knative eventing is um, uh, going to create a pub sub construct for us based on this notion of a, a broker and a trigger. A broker, uh, logically speaking anyways, is going to be something, uh, might just be an in-memory broker, or it could be something like Kafka, Nats, so on and so forth. A trigger is what is actually making our subscription um, to this particular uh, this particular broker, the broker will define what the backing ch uh, what the backing channels are that we'll uh, be looking at. You'll s uh, see a better example of that in a second on the next slide, right? And we have a filter here. We may not want all the events that um, are being emitted out of this broker, and then that's where our last few slides come in. Once we say, hey, you know, I, I I've got um, a subscription here going to your broker. Um, I'm filtering, maybe I'm not, um, maybe I just want you to give me all events. Um, either way, that is actually going to call our Knative service, right? And that is what we've just put. Um, uh, that particular Knative service should be injected with a sidecar. Remember, it's also, we've also got a few other things that's interacting with it that are also injected with a sidecar and are performing uh, MTLS and potentially authorization policies, all the goodness we would get out of uh, all the goodness we would get out of Istio. So in our most simple uh, sense, what that really implies is this kind of source to service simple delivery. What we're going to see in our demo is something a little bit more, it's, we're not gonna get too complex, sorry, but it's something a little bit more complex. So that, that source, is uh, that broker is actually, be, what it really is is a um, event source. Uh, where it's, uh, uh, I shouldn't say that. The broker is defining what this channel implementation is. An event source is the thing that it's emitting things into the broker or into our channels. What we'll notice here is we have a subscription um, that we talked about previously. Um, logically um, and physically, this is a trigger resource. Um, but we also have the logical construct of a subscription. Unfortunately, you can't wire one up without a trigger, but the two things um, uh, aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, what that will do um, as a result, as, we're, um, as our event source is emitting these things, our broker has wired up our particular channel for um, in a namespace to handle things in a certain way. For instance, uh, this could be, again, an in-memory channel. It could be a NATS channel. It could be a Kafka channel. The subscription is going to say, hey, you're my sync service, and I actually want to, um, I'm, going to uh, subs I'm going to subscribe um, to the thing that's publishing um, events. And inevitably, I, uh, I have my source sync dichotomy or my pub sub uh, dichotomy as well. Again, it's really, really important to note that this guy here is in our mesh and needs to be injected. That means that some of these other things are, probably need to be in our mesh and probably need to be injected, as they can't talk to each other or complete the handshake without being injected. That's a pretty important thing. Um, because we don't necessarily want uh, uh, anybody being able to admit anything to any particular service. We also don't want it to be, if you guys will remember our governance talk, we really, really, really don't want to have 10,000 bespoke ways of doing this. It would be great if we had one technically consistent approach. Cool. And this is, again, um, another uh, kind of, a, this is a physical view of what's happening in um, Knative eventing, hopefully this is big enough for you guys to see. But again, we have our event source. We have something in, uh, here's, we have Knative serving, and here we have Knative eventing. In Knative eventing, I'm going to wire up a dispatcher that's gonna talk to my, uh, um, uh, that's gonna talk to my event source. The, that's gonna create my logical broker construct. 
that exists in um, uh, a particular application namespace, right? Um, when we lay in a channel um, uh, into our application namespace, that's actually going to call our, uh, that dynamic admissions webhook that I talked about. That is then going to say, hey, yay or nay, you're good to go. It'll let this guy in, and the, our controller is going to um, start doing some stuff. We, our subscription is based on um, the things that the controllers decided to do. And again, our dispatcher is going to do a little bit more um, or, uh, than just talk to our event source. It's actually going to come over here into our Knative serving ingress. The ingress controller then at that point decides to activate or potentially, um, uh, this is drawn a little bit, a bit incorrectly, it should be like this. Um, is going to activate or potentially just send on the uh, traffic to the service, right? And auto the auto scaler will also be talking to our Knative service as well. This guy is going to be injected as part of our service mesh. And remember, we injected both of these guys, the auto scaler and the activator, because this guy is talking to this guy as well. So we know that nothing, uh, the thing that showed up and talked to our Knative service didn't just come out of nowhere. There was a handshake that was governed by us. We did that in a centralized way via Istia. All right. Cool. All right, but Knative vetting, unfortunately, unlike Knative serving, doesn't work right out of the box. There's a bunch of different things we need to do. Um, we need to inject some sidecars here. Notably, um, you'll see here, and um, this is well covered in the uh, repo that uh, we saw earlier, <clears throat> we, need to uh, we need to inject our vetting controller, we need to inject our vetting webhook, um, so on and so forth. We have a couple of different flavors here of uh, controller and dispatcher. Um, uh, uh, specifically, the, in this particular CR, our um, in-memory uh, broker is being um, injected. So this all comes, uh, I think I'm going to have enough time for this. This all comes down to our, um, uh, our demo. And so our, what our demo is attempting to do is take on, really fully take on those cloud native constructs um, that we saw previously. Um, uh, this is uh, um, a, uh, I'm sure everybody here is uh, familiar with Alistair Cockburn. If you're not, Google it immediately and read everything he's ever written. Um, but uh, this is something that we refer to as hexagonal architecture, and that's why it's depicted in this uh, um, uh, fashion. What hexagonal architecture is also called is ports and adapters, meaning that the way we would like to construct our software architectures, according to Alistair Cockburn, is that we want to have adapters out here on, on the outside and ports into our actual, um, uh, the things that actually happen in our business. So um, here we'll notice we have uh, event stream processors, we have an event sync, and inevitably we have an event store in the middle there. That is where our business is happening, right? The event store or it could be something like Kafka, heck, maybe it's a database, so on and so forth, um, <clears throat> uh, so on and so forth. But this is what we're after with this particular um, uh, with this particular uh, um, uh, demo. So, real quick, let's demo. All right. So, um, I'm more of a CLI guy. I hope you guys don't mind. Can everybody see this, or is it too small? It's pretty small. Uh, doo -doo -doo. It's going to be maybe too big. Cool. So if you've been working along and doing the demo, uh, you'll notice we've got a few things here. Um, we've got, uh, well, let's start maybe a little more simply. Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll uh, stop being a red hatter. <laughs> cool. Uh, st 
It's a origin client. Um, Cool, here's my Istio system namespace. Um, you'll notice I have a few things wired up. We're using Istio, we're using, uh, Istio 2X uh, with Maestro, so you'll notice Istio D there. In my particular case, I called it Knative Governance. Um, we have in, uh, there are a couple of differences with Maestro versus other, um, uh, versus other um, Istio uh, distributions. Um, we have a, a couple of different objects, a service mesh control plan, And you'll notice um, uh, this is uh, Meister specific, but you could easily get there with Istio Cuddle. Um, what this does is a few different things. It wires up uh, the things that we see here are Ingress Gateway, um, Jaeger, Kiali, so on and so forth, right? Um, Prometheus as well, um, uh, Grafana. Um, uh, as well as we have um, a few other things going on in the background. Meister will also go out and lay network policies down for us. Um, if we, you get into the nuts and bolts of the actual uh, um, workshop, um, uh, if you get into the nuts and bolts of the actual workshop, you'll notice um, uh, that we actually need to go um, uh, lay some things out, um, uh, so on and so forth. It also defines something called Um, service mesh member roles. And again, this is a Meister specific concept, but we don't need Meister to get there, right? We could easily get there with Istio Cuddle and network policies, so on and so forth. But what essentially this does is our uh, service mesh member roles will be um, things that we've said, hey, you are um, uh, a part of our mesh. And in our case, um, we have a few different things. We have MQ streams, Knative eventing, Knative serving, and um, our application namespace for our particular demo is going to be service mesh con. Um, as you guys can tell, I'm quite creative. Cool. So let's take a peek at what we have in um, uh, Knative serving. Well, as we talked about previously, we have an activator, we have an autoscaler. There's a few other interesting things that are going on here. Um, we'll notice that we also have an Istio webhook, right? Because remember, we didn't just take full-on Knative serving out of the box with Courier. We said, hey, we want you to use something else for Ingress. We want you to use Istio. What we'll notice here is we have an Istio webhook. That's going to also be pro uh, providing these sorts of admissions and validation control over the things that are allowed to come in. Right? We've got some networking um, that's being done, as well as our standard Knative webhook as well. Um, noticeably, our standard Knative webhook is not um, injected. That doesn't mean everything can get to it. This is one of the drums we uh, bang in the... Um, this is one of the drums we bang in our actual instructions, but um, uh, what, uh, um, uh, sorry, what, um, what you may need to do um, if you're using another Istio operator, is you may need to go uh, lay down some uh, network policies. What we'll notice here is we have a bunch of different network policies. Uh, these were all laid out by our particular Istio operator. Um, and what this is going to say is, hey, some things can come here, some things can't. Generally speaking, that service mesh member roles object we just looked at, that's going to define the things that can uh, talk to each other. We've actually blocked all traffic from outside of this namespace unless you're labeled in a particular way. Right? Um, we'll depend on the cube, uh, our Kubernetes RBAC, to enforce some notion of governance there. Not everybody, hopefully, in your org can label a namespace. Um, if they can, you've got problems. However, um, all right. So we're up on uh, that was uh, we're up on the end of the first session. Um, the second session, um, uh, we're actually going to see more of the demo. We'll walk through Knative eventing. Um, what we did there, why we needed to do those things in Knative eventing. Maybe we'll do that real quick. Yes. 
Cool. And uh, real quick in our last minute, we'll notice that we have a bunch of stuff in Knative Eventing that's wired up uh, uh, with Istio as well inside it, right? Um, if we'll remember the schematics we were looking at, um, when we get an invocation um, via an event source, it's going to hit these guys first, right? Because we've injected these guys, we'll be able to, and because we're both members of the service mesh, we'll be actually able to call each other. So what we'll see, inevitably, is we have two Knative services. And that, give that a second, and it should spit out some stuff. Unless, yeah, it didn't spell anything. To do today. Cool. That took way too long. So um, those two integration things that I just uh, spoke about, as I said, I'm using Camel K. It's just making my life a little bit easier. But we have these two Knative services. These are going to be sitting in our service mesh con event uh, in our service mesh con namespace. What we'll notice uh, right now is, um, which we just saw up here, one of them is scaled to zero, the other one is scaled to one. What we'll do, I'm over by a minute, so I, got, I probably should stop, but what we'll do when we come back is um, we'll actually uh, get rid of that event sync integration, we'll start it up, that'll start uh, spraying messages to our channels, and that, then we'll notice that event bus transformation integration scale from zero up, up right? All depending on uh, how much traffic we're bringing in. So we'll all, and then we'll go and look in Kiali and notice, um, uh, or we'll pr actually scratch out, we'll go into Jaeger and notice, hey, this actually got the IMC dispatcher, called the activator, called the autoscaler, came back and called the Knative service. Uh, Evola, governance, so on and so forth. Anyways, guys, um, please come back for session two because um, we'll be out of theory and into the actual bits a little bit more. And then we'll also talk about some uh, next steps once we get past these basic auth oz concepts. Cool. Thanks, guys. And see you later.